Our king has been crowned in a ceremony that took place for the first time in 70 years. And yes, he is my king. And I'll tell you my thoughts on that. From Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, we are live. and welcome to show number nine of Live at PBL TV. I'm Rene Goche. The coronation took place over the weekend and in celebration of this wondrous event, the Guelph Pipe Band was out to honor our newly crowned king in the royal city of Guelph. We took part in a 21 gun salute with two howitzers a little more than 100 meters away from us. And even if you had earplugs on, you could feel the blast all over you. It was, it was an amazing scene to be, <laughs> to see and be a part of. And on that note, let's go to the latest news. In the Eastern US, the standings are showing a horse race between the city of St. Augustine and Greater Richmond in the grade five level. Two points stand, be, stand in between the remainder of the top five with uh, city of Mount Dora, Jamestown, and Harpen Thistle taking third, fourth, and fifth, respectively. The grade four level is still up for grabs with Atlanta and the city of Greenville tied for first and Chattanooga in third. In the grade three level, it is too early to see what is going to happen there, but St. Thomas Episcopal is on top with a four way tie for second place. The 78th Fraser Highlanders will be making an appearance at Metagama at the Metagama Tattoo to celebrate the ship of the same name, the Metagama Centennial Voyage to Canada as Hebrideans settled in the Canadian Maritime Province of Nova Scotia. The event is to take place in August 11th and 12th at the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. In Grand Junction, Colorado, the Grand Valley Highland Games will bring the pipe band life to the Mile High State. It is not known what bands will be there, and I hope to get some sense of that in an, in an update show this week. And as proof that I'm human, when you're a one-man show, there are times when mistakes are made. Case in point is this little stink nugget I left here. John Elliott was not born in 1928, but in 1976. <sighs> Stuff like this is what I... You know, stuff like this is what I hope to present on my update shows, rather than have, having to do it now. <laughs> but to do something like this, and then boom. Yes, he was born in 1976. Not 1928. That was a, that was a guy from a week before. <laughs> but the, it was Chris Anderson, I believe. Yeah interesting thing i guess but uh yes from time to time i am human i make mistakes and uh i learn from them what else can i do and when i return i will have eus pba president bill coddle in a moment
Well, I know. You waited long enough, right? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I decided to do a little change from what I normally do because I wanted to uh, give more of a, a casual feel to the interviews. Um, it felt more like a radio show than anything. I, you know, as much as I love podcasts and that, I, I want to create a better environment for people who appear on the show. So I moved from my chair to my couch. So I can uh, talk with, so I can have a better talk with people, maybe make it feel more comfortable, who knows. So with me is, he is an adjudicator, he's a piper, and most of all, he's the president of the EUSPBA. He is Mr. Bill Cuddle. Welcome to the show, Bill. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Okay. Hey, thank you for appearing on the show, for sure. I mean, yeah. it's... Uh... So, let's let's talk a little bit about how everything began for you. I mean, everybody's got a beginning. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I guess I was one of the people that was maybe uh, impacted and influenced by the Roots movement around the time of the American mm -hmm. Boston Daniel, things like that, and then becoming aware and family knowing that, that we had uh, um, Highland ancestors and things like that, um, and also having a bit of an act for music and an interest in that and an interest in the, you know, color and pageantry of things military. And so uh, it, it sort of came together in, in the pipes for me. And when I was eight years old, I asked for bagpipes for Christmas, you know, and here in the Carolinas at that time, that's, uh, it's not something you go down to your local department store and think about picking up. So it was an interesting proposal for my parents, but uh, they were able to get me uh, lined up with, with, a, with a practice channel and let me doodle around a bit with it for a while to see if it was going to take yeah. for the long term. And uh, so sure enough, it did. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of presence and, and, and uh, how can I say, appearances of piping during that time. Uh, you know, uh, piping was really sort of in its in its somewhat young years here in the American South at that time. Uh, yes, it was. It was the year the Black Watch, the Royal Marines were on tour, saw them in Charlotte. And I thought, wow, that's the greatest thing in the world. You know, I want to do that. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I started off being a, a somewhat unusual child out in the country of North Carolina. Uh, uh, but but, but it, it's been a great thing, a true gift and a blessing to me. It's brought me in contact with so many wonderful people, uh, both in my neighborhood as well as across the border with mutual friends that we all have and all. So it's been uh, it's been a great experience. And I never uh, thought that it would, to a great degree, uh, consume as much of my life as it does. Uh, but it is. And and again, I've been truly blessed by that. So uh, that's uh, yes, been a good show. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So tell me a bit about the first band you played with. Well, the first band I played with was a uh, was a street band in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it actually uh, grew out of uh, the teaching of really the first uh, modern day player in in North Carolina that did teaching. It was a man that was a World War One veteran from Ayrshire uh, who'd come across uh, just prior to the first war. Um, eventually migrated down south. Uh, was finally caught up with in his quite um quite late years uh and contracted to to teach in charlotte north carolina to a group that was um being sponsored by a local expatriates club uh a scotch club there that wanted to see a pipe band founded so uh this man came down on a greyhound bus uh you know an afternoon trip they put him up overnight and and sent him back on the bus the next day uh and he talked and, and, and he was uh, evidently a reasonable enough player to have taught people correctly. Uh, he was my teacher's teacher. Um, and, uh, what was his name? I'm sorry. His, his name was, was his Jack name? Smith. Obviously Jack not Smith. the Grangemouth, uh, the Muirhead's predecessors and all that. Jack Smith. In fact, you know, just reach yes. off the wall. I'll, I'll show you a little picture. This is the man right there. And oh, that's, okay. a, that's an appearance at the first performance of a band in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, in yes. 1966, 
but um, he had actually founded what was the first pipe band south of the Mason-Dixon line uh, in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, about 1947. And uh, uh, that was really what got it started here in the South. This and the Charlotte band uh, sort of served as a spur, if you will, uh, uh, an inspiration for, for the proliferation of, of, of piping and drumming in the Carolinas. And it was also uh, gaining interest and starts in other places as well. Uh, uh, General Mark Clark had established uh, a pipe band down at the Citadel, the military college in South Carolina, inspired by what he saw in World War II. So it's really that, that period of the late 40s, early 50s that we first started seeing that um, here in the South, even despite the fact that we had such a, 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 a very strong um, uh, Scottish connection within this region, particularly Highland Scots. Uh, you know, I am, I am not very far uh, removed from uh, the place that Don Rua McCrimmon, the last of the great McCrimmon Pipers, uh, lived for a short time prior to the American Revolution. We know that there were records of Pipers in this area uh, really until about the middle of the 19th century, until the Presbyterian Church sort of put them all down and uh, put music and dance in their place as they felt it should have been. But uh, in any event, so it's it's really a revival type thing and has really grown tremendously in the past 40 plus years, 45 years or so that I've been involved. Uh, sure. you know, now there's not a place in the Carolinas, for example, where you're really more than an hour and a half, maybe two hours at the very most uh, from someone that could get uh, a beginner started and on onto a good foot. Um, uh, we have other places in the South that aren't quite that... Uh, quite that uh, lucky yet, but it's certainly a whole lot better than it was when I was coming up. So, uh, you know, piping continues to grow. And, uh, you know, when you listen to those names of the bands um, that were in the standings there so far, uh, you know, our season has started, our ESPBA season has started in the South now. And so a lot right. of those bands that we're hearing were, were Southern bands. So, uh, and that standard has come a long way as well in, in, in the For past sure. 30 years, particularly. So. What would you say was the major catalyst for all this happening? Well, again, uh, you know, I think a lot of it has been the exposure to uh, to good teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And as I say, I was lucky to be close to an area that that had at least a competent player. Uh, you know, a lot of places here in the South that that still do not have that. I think of places in the Deep South, perhaps. But uh, right, right. Uh, you know, it's 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 been a lot of uh, a lot of good teaching, a lot of exposure. People that were leaders uh, in this area made a point to identify with and bring in um, top players, top instructors. Uh, a lot of that coming from your side of the border. Um, uh, Sandy Jones, the late Sandy Jones, recently passed yes. away. Uh, yes. Fantastic in, in establishing the first summer school in, in, in this part of the world, uh, yes. which has had a tremendous impact on, on, on the growth of piping. Um, one of the uh, great fathers of, of we say grandfathers of, of, of piping in this area is a man named Harvey Rich, who taught virtually hundreds of people. Uh, that came through his import store in the mountains of North Carolina, and he would demonstrate a practice channel and, and show them, you know, what could be done. And they'd take it home, and they may or may not pick it up, but a lot of people did. And and he had a uh, a great impact as well. Um, uh, people like Al McMullen, uh, a name that some people were going to recognize from the 70s and 80s, came south and did a lot of uh, uh, teaching as well as leading of bands that started to make a mark uh, and at a world standard. Uh, so we've been fortunate. We've we, we've grown uh, and continue to grow. We've we've obviously all been weakened a bit by the recent pandemic, uh, but we're starting to get past that now, and uh, hopefully that'll continue an, up, an upward trend. But we do have our challenges. Right. So I came across a name that I am very very familiar with myself, Ed Nye. Oh yes. Oh yes. I mean he's. <laughs> He's the Guelph legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ed, My band. Ed, Ed had a, a tremendous impact on me, uh, not only as a person, but musically as well. Yes. Um, and at the people that he worked with uh, at the North American Academy of Piping. Uh, uh, Ed uh, had a tremendous impact in exposing new music um, 
particularly here in the South, but, but, but even further reaching than that. I remember uh, a few years back, uh, still in Ed's lifetime, I was judging an amateur contest uh, down here. And it used to be in the old days, you'd, you'd hear, say, in the grade three, uh, grade three Peabrook, you know, you'd hear maybe a Sir James McDonald of the Isles, you'd hear of Old Sword, Glengarry's Lament, things like that. Right. There were 12 players, as I recall, very distinctly in that contest. There was only one team that was repeated. It was, these were all teams that were in the musical capabilities of these novice and intermediate players, but Peabrook was coming alive and being exposed, new tunes. You know, it was so refreshing to hear that and see people enjoying and thriving on that music. I mean, Ed was not only a tremendous person, but he was an absolutely inspiring and incredible teacher. And he had a significant impact here in our area, in particular during his years. We miss him by far. His, his, his influence is just as big around my neck of the woods as as it as it was yours i mean yeah, yeah. i mean there's there as a matter of fact uh in in well the town that's next door to me basically guelph mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a, there's actually uh the band itself has uh has a a, a, a memorial fund mm -hmm. in honor of ed and i mm -hmm. so and and to hear his name coming from a guy in North Carolina, it says a lot about Ed Nye. Oh, it, sa it says his influ his influence basically transcended the very province of Ontario. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, and looking back at Ed, he had such a gentle way about him. He had such a great sense of humor. Uh, we had great times in the off hours. Uh, you know, Ed Nye was the person that introduced me to, to the perfect pairing with LaFoy whiskey, uh, chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> you know, little <laughs> things, wonderful things like that that I remember about Ed. And uh, I remember the day that we saw each other last, and our last words, his last words to me were onward and upward. <laughs> and that's wow. sort of been a, 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 a mantra for me. As I work with students and I think about people because I was had no clue that in just a matter of a few weeks it would be it would be truly onward and upward for him. But uh, but yeah, it, it's been a tremendous impact by, by Canadians here in, in in the South and really through obviously throughout the USPDA. But speaking of, of the Southerner, uh, uh, Billy Gilmore came down uh, and, and and did a lot of work with Harvey Rich in in the. Uh, in the late 60s and he was a mentor to him uh ray mckay uh, uh was a favorite at a lot of judging uh events that we had down here uh not only just a great personality but such a wonderful person to express uh uh constructive criticism uh, uh to people here uh you know it could go on and on colin mcclellan um you know a very dear friend uh you know all of these folks that have had that have always had time for us down south here, and uh, we've tried to do what we could to show in the best southern hospitality we could, but um, of course. we feel a kindred spirit with, with you folks north of the St. Lawrence. So, uh. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So let's go into another gentleman. Um, he recently passed, Sandy Jones. Huh? Um, tell me a bit about his influence on you. You know, Sandy uh, came south here uh, just about the time that I was seriously getting involved in playing. And it was a couple of years later that uh, that my folks uh, enrolled me in one of the summer schools in the North Carolina mountains. It was a beautiful setting. Um, everybody felt comfortable when Sandy Jones was around. And he'd take care of the kids. He'd, he'd, he'd treat us right. He'd... he'd uh, He'd uh, give us good instruction, and, and I had days and years and hours of, of, of wonderful memories with Sandy. Mm -hmm. And and you know, Sandy was one of those folks that you know, there were always um, people that you think about that you might want to emulate in some ways. And there was always these takeaways that I had from all these people that I had the good fortune of at least being introduced to or, or exposed to in some way. But Sandy. Uh, 
was sort of one of these larger than life characters. And I know when, when I wrote a letter to, uh, to his wife, um, Dorcas, uh, just after he passed, you know, there'll never be another person that I think lived life out loud the way Sandy Jones did. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, he had a lot of health issues in his, in his latter years, but he was still living. He was a man's man. He would go out and, and, and be the life of the party and, and, and have these great stories about all of his military time with U.S. Air Force pipe band. Yes. And he was always good with kids and, and teaching and things like that. Um, you know, he, he's a definite loss, a definite loss. He had an impact. He played for my wedding. Uh, you know, had all these Piper friends, but he was the person right. I felt was sort of a mentor uh, and had been a mentor. And I was lucky to be able to work with him and teach with him at his school for 29 years. Um uh, alongside folks like Ed and I and Colin McClellan right. and others. And uh, we just had a great friendship. I look at those years and I think we spent two and a half years or better of our lives together uh, when we added up all the time. And uh, that's that's a whole lot of time and you get to know someone pretty well. Uh, great sure. character, be, be, be sorely missed. Uh, sorely yeah, missed. indeed, indeed, very much. So, um, so you, you had all these wonderful mentors, and that basically led you to. <coughs> excuse you. Well, that yeah. basically. <laughs> yeah. That basically led you into. Into doing solos as well as band work, so. Yeah. So you won several solo championships, over the years. Mm -hmm. Um. At what point did you basically say that, you know, I've done enough solos, maybe do something better? At uh, what point did you think that, I mean, you, you, there's only so many challenges that you can have as a soloist. And then when all those, ch when you've overcome all those challenges, what is, what more is there when You've gone past that. You've you've take, done all your challenges. You you passed them with flying colors. What do you do from there? Well, I'll tell you what. I I ended my solo career um, uh, a few years back, and part of that was in great degree due to a uh, spinal injury that I suffered actually playing in a concert. Uh, mm -hmm. I ruptured C three through C seven. Uh, when I was playing in a contest uh, that Jimmy McIntosh had uh, had uh, had sponsored and helped grow um, uh, due to some friends that had contributed some money in his honor, and he was always bringing over one of the uh, one of the Balmoral influenced players to judge. And I'd been a fan of Breton music for some time, and Jackie Pince was over judging, and I was playing the limit for Captain McDougal, and I had about three instances of fingers going numb, and all of a sudden they went out, and I was gone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I felt at that time not only did I lose a little sensation in my fingers uh, uh, as a result of that injury, but uh, I said, hey, if you're getting stressed out enough about this, then it's time to, to, to put it aside. I, I had a long and fun career of it. Uh, no, I never went to Inverness or Oban, but I uh, went mm -hmm. as far as I could being from the South here. And uh, um, I'm proud of that. But you know, I think all of us that are in this for for life and, and those of us that are passionate about it want to give back and, and, and to see this this art form, which we have we are custodians of uh, to be perpetuated. And so I've been involved in teaching. I've, uh, I've, I've gotten great satisfaction out of seeing young players come up from being able to play that first good tune on the bagpipe to, to, to seeing them be able to play in a band, to see them advance in the competitive ranks, um, to seeing my own son uh, rise up through the ranks as well, which mm. is the one I'm, I'm perhaps most proud of. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, we've got to give back. We've got to get back, and and you know, there's there's a lot of folks that uh, you know may say they don't have the time for it. They won't be, you know. We've got to give back. We've got to continue giving back. 
And uh, you know, if we don't, um, you know, we're going to be living in in one of the final generations of this art in in North America. So we've got to get more volunteers involved. Uh, everything from folks helping out at the games to to folks that are willing to to help with communications and organization of events, um, to to encouraging young players. Uh, you know, we've got to beat the bushes and get kids interested in this. When you know, when I was coming up. As a young person, during the summer times in the country in North Carolina, you either played Little League Baseball or you did maybe 4-H and raised your uh, raised your, uh, your little calf there or something like yes. that. Well, I happened to play the bagpipes, and, and I wasn't good enough at, at, at baseball or animal husbandry to, uh, to succeed <laughs> in anything else. So maybe that divine hand led me to this, something that I could maybe in some way make a mark with. But... but um, We've got to give back. We've got to get as many people involved as, as, as we can to keep this going. Each one, teach one, and then something like that. Yeah, I mean, when when you have gone as far as you have, you know, there is that sense that you need to give back. After everything you've received, it, it's time to give back. So... Yeah, you know, when I had no intentions or, or, or vain intentions in, in, in becoming president of our association. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of years, we had apathy. And we still do to some degree because folks are not, were not stepping up to the plate and running for office. We had a lot of our top offices which were running uncontested. And that wasn't, I didn't have anything against necessarily the people that were, that were in those offices. But to me, that was a sign of an unhealthy organization. Yes. And, and, and so there had to be folks like myself that were going to step up. Hey, I don't know it all, but I've got ideas and I've sort of been there and, and done everything there is to do in our association from being a competitor to, to a games founder. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's given me some things to share. I don't have all the answers, but, but no. people have to step up. They've got to step up and, and, and assume at least try, uh, otherwise we're going to flounder. We're going to flounder. So basically are, are you, it sounds to me like you're concerned with all the branches in, in the association at this point. Is that would that be a correct statement? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm obviously speaking as as a southerner, but but I'm I'm concerned about what's happening, say, in our southwest branch in Texas. Give an example. We have we have some good players in Texas, right? And all the players in Texas are not right around Houston. There are people in places far flung in Texas that are good players. Well, it's a big. They it's don't a big get state. the opportunity to come out and compete, make their names known, uh, much less in some cases, have the opportunity uh, uh, for good caliber instruction, because in some of those cases, you're talking an eight or nine hour drive, you know, we're, yeah. we're to the closest time of games now. <laughs> now uh, like yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, we've got, you know, issues like that. We have, uh, you know, situations in our Metro New York, New Jersey branch where you've got a lot of bands that are not affiliated with our associations. They all the police and mm -hmm. service bands, which, uh, you know, that's, that's one that we need to tap into in a big way because we're seeing a huge proliferation of the service bands, the fire and police and sheriff's things. That, yes. Yes. You know, uh, to, to me, I, I recently taught at a workshop for, uh, uh, for some of those folks down in Florida and there were 18 or 19, uh, domains police departments sheriff's departments community right right uh, service organizations represented i asked how many of you have heard the eastern united states pipe band association there were only three of them that had any knowledge that there was an organization that provided resources education uh all sorts of opportunities for them you know they're sort of in their own world and uh, mm -hmm. uh so when we turn on our our television these days at least here in the u.s and we hear bagpipes 90% of the time or greater, it's going to be for a fallen police or sheriff's officer or, sure. or something like that. And those people are now the people that are out representing our instrument and our tradition. 
And we have a duty, I think, to bring those people up and nurture them and make them as good as we can make them. If they're going to be the public eye, if they're going to be the public uh, um, uh, image of our instrument and our tradition, then, then we need to do everything we can to support and help them. You know, a lot of those groups go out and they try to play Scotland the Brave and Amazing Grace and a couple of Irish teams, and that's it. Yeah. Well, all right, if that's going to be it, then, then let's make it as good as, 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 as can be. Let them put the best foot forward for the instrument that they can. Um, well, that's sort of what they that's sort of what they tried to do in Ontario. There's there are a series of police bands and they are affiliated with the PBBSO. Mm -hmm. And these are competitive bands. Mm -hmm. And for case in point, Peel Regional Police, mm -hmm. grade two, oh, a yeah. very good band. Uh, I've I play I, I was I know John Karen's very well. And the biggest reason why these they have competitive bands in some of these police bands is because it it was a way to attract the best pipers, the best drummers. Mm -hmm. And by fostering that by fostering that culture, mm -hmm. they may they actually attracted a lot of terrific people. Mm -hmm. And I'll, and if you ever get a chance to to listen to the Peel Grade Two, oh, yeah. they're terrific. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. I'll bet you've heard. I bet you've heard their signature tune too. Well, yeah, it, it, you, know, it, it, you know, I guess what they've got going on there. Um, you know, you're a little bit different in in, in Ontario, having a few more uh, British Scottish expats that are located there than are located here. Um, uh, but that said, you know, that's perhaps we're seeing now in like South Florida, maybe, uh, what may have been happening in Ontario in say the 1930s or forties, maybe something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. it's got a long way to go. Um, you know, the police departments here, um, uh, you know, here, here in the South, it, it, it's, it's not been a thing, you know, as it's been in large metropolitan areas up North, New York, Boston, places like that. Um, well, they, know, got, still, they have yeah. Celtic traditions. Yeah, yeah, New York, absolutely. Boston. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you would think that there would be more service bands from Massachusetts and New York participating in the EUSPBA. Yeah, and there are there are some, but there's others that you know sort of are out doing their own thing. You know, and uh, and, and, and we need to sort of reach out to them. I know annually they have. Uh, there's an annual uh, uh, service band contest that they have up in Washington, D.C. These folks that uh, come out and do their own thing. And, and they have some of our association judges sometimes uh, uh, give them little crit sheets and things like that. They have a great time with it. Uh, they look good. They they are sounding much better each year. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a growing thing. It's a growing mm -hmm. thing. For us. Absolutely. Uh, so hopefully that's going to continue. But in, in that in in some ways, it's perhaps growing uh, a bit more healthily than uh, than some of our civilian bands are. Um, you know, we've we've been hit hard uh, by the COVID pandemic. A lot of people saw after two years that you know it's sort of nice to be home for a weekend and have your grass mowed or not have your <laughs> wife on your back for being away every weekend or something like that. But uh, yes. You know, it's going to come back. Um, you know, I was just noticing the last contest that I judged, uh, the last games we had here uh, in our circuit uh, about three weeks ago. And we're starting to see the numbers coming back. Um, the sound is definitely improving from what we just had that first year back last year. Yes. Um, still has some rough edges to work out and all there, but, uh, but it's coming back. But we've got right, to keep right. that pipeline going uh, of, of getting the new people involved and interested and and and, uh, and 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 moving into to, to what we're doing here, um, I was just hearing at the Annapolis Summit in Kansas City about the great program, and it sounds like you started there in Hamilton through the police organization there. Uh, you know, involving young people and after school things and, and all like that. You know, we're uh, again a little bit different animal than that uh, down here, but. I hope that a lot of our bands are looking for those opportunities now as they're getting 
you know, trying to beef the numbers back up. Everybody's always right. looking for drummers. Where do we find them? You know, that yeah. sort of thing. Get the new uh, bands. Get new bands yeah. in. Get as many bands as you can. I mean, I've uh, I've looked at your, I've looked at your standings. I've looked at your, uh, I've looked at the number of competitors you have, and probably the the ones that the, that you seem to have the mo biggest challenge with is the grade two and grade one level. Obviously, because you have only one grade one band, the city of Dunedin. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then yeah. and then you do, and I didn't see any. I guess I'd be concerned at the grade two level as well because you need a strong grade. You need a strong grade two to build a grade one. Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. And and, and there are organizations that are coming along. Uh, there, they've not been out. Uh, we had the Norfolk Tattoo uh, contest just a few weeks ago, uh, uh, which had uh, a good showing not only of, yes. of, of our USPBA bands but a couple down from Ontario, the Midwest as well. Um, yes, I. You know, we've yeah. got. Uh, the Worcester band going up in Massachusetts playing in grade two. I've not heard them in a couple of years, but they've always seemed to produce something really fine up there. Uh, and, and down in Philadelphia, they've got the Ulster organization that's, uh, that's playing very well as well. And uh, I happen to be part of the Macmillan pipe band right now that's uh, uh, out of the DC area with a few of us coming from some distance uh, uh, to join in. So you got three that are really doing quite well at the grade two level. Um, you know, we had some others that were knocking on the door. A grade three is a bit weak right now. Uh, south of the Mason Dixon, we're not as plentiful in the grade three uh, as we were uh, about five, six years ago. Uh, a couple that have had to downgrade due to numbers, things like that. But the right. grade two scene is uh, it's there, it's, it's not plentiful. Um, but those bands are playing at a very high standard. If you heard that contest in Norfolk. Uh, on a first outing for for all of those bands, I think uh, standard was pretty darn high. Uh, well, right now the the grade three bands are the bands to watch at this point because uh, I mean the it's it, it's come down to quality of competition, and, and that's the and that's a thing that tends to suffer when you don't have enough bands playing at at these levels, yeah. and that's and that and that's what I find to be the the biggest area of concern. Because a grade one band needs to be a world contender if they if they even have a chance of staying as a grade one band. Yeah. A grade two band needs to be needs to be built because a grade two band is that band at that critical point where you can make a break and and it's it that's the house of card stage for any band. That well, grade two stage. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I, I know I, I'm not as well attuned to uh, the Worcester situation, right. uh, but but I do know that the Ulster and and the Macmillan bands both, uh, uh, you know, are, are really coming on strong. Both have made uh, good improvements over last year, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that goal is not to to just stop at grade one. The, the, both of those organizations have. Have a strong future and uh, and, and will be hopefully knocking at that door for the next year uh, or or a couple of years at the most I would think. Um, you know we've also got down in uh, down in Houston. You know the 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 uh, uh, St. Thomas Alumni Band. Uh, you know which which certainly has has done well at the grade two and now the grade one yes, stand as absolutely. well. So uh, you know they're they're sort of uh, uh, occupying that that sort of part of the middle. United States, uh, you know, at, at, at grade three bands we had here in the South, we were really setting what was truly at, at a world standard uh, about five, six years ago. Uh, the Atlanta Pipe Band, my own band I had here, St. Andrews University, the Waken District Band, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, several of those bands were really, really setting a very high standard in grade three. Um, but uh, then again, the pandemic hit. Uh, a lot of those, in my case, the university band, always going to be changing uh, and, and changed dramatically due to uh, the economic downturn here in the U.S. falling 2008. Oh, of course, of course. But, uh, yeah. but, 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 but nonetheless, those you know, bands ebb and flow. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of historically what's happened in, in Ontario as well. I mean, at one point, yes. look at all the grade one bands you used to have. And now <laughs> yes. you're, you know, there's... Uh, that those bands are down, and, and we've grown these super bands as well. You know, I mean, I remember, 
um, I took uh, I took the St. Andrews University band out to Las Vegas a few years ago, and Harry McNulty was judging, and he just judged um, he, he judged the grade three, I think the world's uh, the three A, uh, you know, the, the the year previous, and we went out with what was a strong band. We had about fourteen pipes and I think seven or eight sides, um, four tenors and a bass. And and he told us afterwards, you know, said, yeah, you're you, you would have been right at the at the top of the mark in grade three, and you'd probably been able to contend in grade two if you had a few more players. And I'm like, my goodness, you know, when I was growing up, I competed a number of times in grade three bands that were going on the field with eight players, you know, eight pipers, you know. I mean, the the, the numbers game, uh, you know, again, is one that has its pluses and minuses, and uh, there's a lot of different opinions and thoughts about that too, but. Uh, Sure, uh, for sure. And then, uh, then again, we are we are where we at where we are now until somebody makes that move uh, and, <laughs> and, sure. and, and decides, hey, we're going to reduce, we're going to reduce. You, know, you look back at historically the Edinburgh Police and shots and all these bands that historically were playing with half of a present day drum corps, you know, half of a present day pipe section, you know, and. Those are the bands I, I, I grew up listening to, the vinyl and the cassettes. And, you know, I thought that's what you want to emulate, you know, and, and it's a different animal now for sure. Okay, so the American Pipe Band Championships came and went. So what is the next big event on the Eastern U.S. Circuit? Eastern U.S. Circuit. Uh, we had the return this year of the games in Fairhill, Maryland, which were uh, – uh, in years past, were considered the Eastern United States Championships. Um, they lost a venue, had a change of venue, obviously the pandemic, um, had some bad weather days, as did a couple of other events. That's the next one coming up um, next weekend. There's a games here in the South. Uh, you know, uh, we have so many games, you know, compared to Ontario, compared to BC, we're comparing notes at Napa. You know, we're running, I think last year we ran about 62 events. Yeah, and these are all uh, regional. It's, it, it, it's huge. Now, now some of those, you know, being sort of more festival type events with just solo piping, but uh, you know, some of the larger games uh, are, are starting to attract decent numbers again. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I know last year at Stone Mountain, Georgia, which is one of the bigger things we've had band wise in the southeast, we're back up to twenty plus bands. Um, I mean, we were very fortunate coming out of the pandemic, uh, the games that I founded and host here in Scotland County, that was the first thing out of the pandemic. And I think we had 15 bands. I think that was the largest band contest held in the Northern Hemisphere that year. Mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, you know, everybody wanted to get back, wanted to get back into it. And, and, and they're doing their best to, to, to do that with the expenses of, of, of travel being what they are, hotel stays yeah. uh, being what they are, as well as losing, you know, band revenues after two years of pandemic, things like that. Um, you know, I think what our what our bands need to do is to support the games as much as they can, but then perhaps we also need to look at um, perhaps curtailing some of our sanctioning. I hate to say that, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can get to the point where you get so many games in a circuit that nobody's won it. Uh, right. you know, we yeah, yeah. support these events that have been traditionally strong events going forward. Uh, I look at events that be close to some of your, uh, some of our friends in Ontario. You know, there used to be a, a, a good presence of, of Ontario folks coming down to Ligonier, Pennsylvania you know, in the 70s and 80s, things like that. And that game mm -hmm. you know, is, is now only a shadow of its former self, but trying to come back. Um, you know, we've got a lot like that. Um, but coming up on the, on the calendar, we've got Fair Hill, um, a number of smaller games throughout the Northeast uh, during the summer as well. Um, uh, Loon Mountain coming up uh, in the in, in the late summer as well, which is fairly convenient and close to you friends in, in Ontario. Um, we've also got, uh, uh, as I said, Grandfather Mountain, a large solo contest in, in July, um, which has stood as, as one of our premier events as well. Uh, for a number of years, uh, are all here in Scotland County. Um, uh, several of these games are 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 serving this year as as qualifiers for the new Sun Belt uh, contest. There's going to be an amateur contest at the Sun Belt down in Florida in in November. So uh, 
Grandfather Mountain and Loon Mountain and Scotland County, uh, as well as Dunedin, Florida, which we've already had, uh, right. sort of served as qualifiers for that. So we're getting some of our top grade one players are getting that extra little boost to go out and try to be part of that. So the encouragement of that sort of you know increased competition and 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 boosting each other each other up and and constantly trying to elevate that level of play and standard. Things like that are, are going to be very helpful and, and healthy for us. So uh, glad to see those things happening. Um, we've already heard within our association that the Metro Cup is coming back next year in the Metro uh, New York, New Jersey area. You know, that was one of our premier events for a number of years. Um, and uh, so we are sort of getting our, our, ourselves back in the saddle uh, in terms of growth of, uh, of our events and trying to encourage those players of all levels. Um, for example, one of the things that we started this year is an under 18 open event. Uh, any kid that's, uh, that's under 18 can compete in, in these under 18 events. And that builds a bit of fraternity and camaraderie among those kids. And, uh, you know, it's going to help, I think, uh, in, in increasing that standard uh, within those younger players as well. You know, you, you, you may have a uh, an up and coming grade three player that might be playing against a, a young grade one player in cases like that. But mm -hmm. you know, it, it gives them that extra something to work for and, and to see that they're not alone and, and, and there are other young people like them and, and they're building those friendships and, 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 and fellowship that will help take them forward and help them be the leaders of, of our movement tomorrow. So um, a lot of things like that that we're trying to, to do to promote the, to assist and and uh, and promote the young people as best we can. It seems to me that your challenge is very geographical. I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, because I mean, the, the you got the a lot of the pipe band associations are in Canada are on a provincial level, but yours is a multi-state level. Oh yeah, yeah. How do you manage that? Well, we do manage, uh, and in some things we don't maybe do quite as well as we could. But, uh, uh, for example, one of the things that we had brought forward at our AGM this year was the fact that some of our competitors felt like we needed a more standardized way of running our events, that every event is going to be the same, like it is in Scotland, like the way it is maybe in Ontario, like the way it is in, in, in BC. Um, right. This is a question of quantity versus quality as well. Would you, well, would you well think? yeah. And but 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 when I was when I was talking to the folks at Napa in Kansas City, right, and they were talking about stewards. I know you've got stewards. I, I always admired and loved Andy Donaghy, who was always in Ontario. It seemed all <laughs> yes, Andy, down here. Andy. And, and and you got Lynn Bullis out out in uh, out in BC as well. Lovely yes. lady. They asked, she is, who is your, your steward? Who are your stewards? And I said, when I go to a games, I might get anything from Boy Scouts to volunteers that have never been there before, but are anxious right. and have a smile on their face and anxious to help. And well, Lynn it, it, has it, a lot to offer you, my friend. Yeah, because. there's a lot of things that we yeah. just have not been able to and are not able to standardize to the same level that a lot of other associations have been. Well, but we're trying yeah, to educate and, and to get those folks as as well acquainted with the proper procedures and all as we can. That's going to be an ongoing yeah. challenge. But uh, we're doing our best to, to try to address that. Right. You're back to that quantity versus quality thing yeah. here. Because, I mean, yes, uh, when you have as many events as you have, getting uh, getting stewards trained, I mean, that's – because your your region is so large, oh, yeah. you have you you obviously have to subdivide each region and have somebody taking charge of all of, of as many stewards as possible in each region, and then from there you got it, it, there's a lot of management that comes into play, and your and your geographical area is so large. I mean, the, I mean you've got eastern U.S., Midwest, and Western these. These regions are huge compared with, say, a provincial uh, a provincial region. Yeah. So yeah. yes, you've got your challenge is is huge because 
you have so many you have you have well over yeah you have the original 13 states and the and a few more in there and then next thing you know you <laughs> oh, and then, well, that's, yeah that's it that's it and and, and with the proliferation of, of of games and events uh going on you've got to find somebody in that region that at least has some experience and 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 knowledge to be able to take uh take an event and run with it so uh yes yes it is an ongoing challenge for us it is an ongoing challenge for us i don't know that we'll i don't think it's not going to happen in my administration i i don't think we can provide the education as best we can to pass on to these people but as far as truly standardizing it and consolidating it um i think it's going to take um uh, a bigger a bigger entity a bigger uh uh, a better person than me to, to 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 truly get that organized in the same way and to the same level that some associations have it. But right. on that side, uh, on the flip side, we're you know very fortunate to have these people that come out that that, that make these events happen, and for the most part, they go off without major hitches, and we're really blessed uh, as a result of that. You know, uh, uh, that people have been very accepting for the most part. Uh, if a little thing goes wrong, the schedule goes off slightly, something like that. We're very accommodating. Uh, the competitors have been for the most part. Um, but uh, in any event, we, we do the best we can. We do the best we can. And Absolutely. we continue Absolutely. to evolve and learn, as does everyone else. But we're certainly, we certainly do have, have growth pains, for sure. Yes, for sure. I mean, uh, I probably, uh, I guess me just talking i mean my my thoughts are uh trying to foster state trying to get state associations fostered and then from there using using those state associations to form to make up the alliance of the eus pba that's yeah. probably one way to do it but we, we are we are split up into regions the northeast which basically is going to take everything down to about pennsylvania the mid-atlantic which takes uh, uh, basically Philadelphia area south to the D.C., Virginia area to the North Carolina border. Uh, southeast takes everything with the Carolinas to Florida, west through Georgia and Alabama, Tennessee. Southwest, uh, pretty much everything west of Mississippi. Yeah, it's, it, it, you know, even those subdivisions that we have now are, 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 are pretty massive in and of themselves. Yes, indeed, indeed, and we, I, don't we envy your, I don't envy you at all. It's a, uh, I see the challenge. I see, uh, I, I see the enormity of it. And yes, obviously, it's it's not going to. It's going to take more than one person. It's going to take, and it's oh, going to yeah. take time. And uh, and yes, the, I guess it comes down to finding more people who are, who are passionate about the same things. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and we're very fortunate. I'm blessed. I, I have a great exec, executive committee, some uh, that I inherited, others that came in at the same time with me, uh, folks of, of varying degrees of, of background and, and interest. Um, uh, and, and it's a great thing. We all work together as, as a good team. And that's the best thing about it. Uh, of course. That, that, that we're all in the game together and we all know where we're going and we're going to try to get there together. Terrific. So uh, that's about the serious stuff about associations. <laughs> because we got to talk about the fun stuff. Traveling. Oh, yeah. Traveling. Come, come down. Come down. You, you know, we've got some great events. Uh, you know, uh, all the all the folks north of the St. Lawrence seem to know where Myrtle Beach is. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> I always thought it'd be great to have a spring contest in your Can-Am days. You know, that Myrtle Beach. You know, let's do it sometime. We'll get together and work on that. You know, that'd be a great thing. Yeah, that does sound um, like it. It does sound like a great idea. Yeah, it does. Be a great thing. Uh, you, you know, and uh, but but we've always welcomed folks. It, it, it's great to have the, the folks from Ontario, as well as other places uh, that, that come into our games. Uh, they're always given a good, warm welcome. And uh, you know, it, 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 I know we've got a lot of presence that goes across the border for Maxwell and. And other events up there that we always enjoy, and uh, we've just got a great fraternity on both sides of St. Lawrence and uh, in the Maritimes and all as well. And uh, come on down, come down south, come down south. Sure. So, uh, okay. so tell me a little bit about what is what would you say is the the most picturesque event on your circuit? 
Oh, goodness. Uh, I could get into a lot of trouble uh, on on this one. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, granted, uh, it, it, for a lot of reasons, uh, um, I think Grandfather Mountain ha has got to have that, the, 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 the mountain setting and things like that. Um, the Appalachians? It, it, it's... Uh, it's not maybe the most friendly for for solo competitors. There is no mm -hmm. band contest or anything. It's it, it's grown so much where it's oftentimes difficult to get to the mountain. There's no parking on site or anything, things like that. But it's one of those things that should be on everybody's bucket list, if nothing else. But we've mm -hmm. got a lot of beautiful ones throughout the throughout the place. I, I love going to Ligonier, Pennsylvania, in the end of the summer, uh, early fall. Um, uh, Glasgow lands in, in Massachusetts, a lovely venue and hot summer day in Massachusetts, but lovely. Uh, I love my own Scotland County because we've got all the Scottish connections and background here and try to mm -hmm. exercise that. Stone Mountain, Georgia, the great uh, event there that's been going on for years. We, all of our games, I think anyone would, would, would have a warm welcome, uh, no matter if they're coming from across the border if they've never been south, southerners going north. Um, yes. I myself have had nothing but warm welcomes everywhere I've gone. And as you know, our, our fraternity is a special and friendly one. We've all got a lot in common, and so we enjoy each other's company. And uh, But, yeah, so, so in a nutshell, I, I've left somebody out. I'm going to get in big trouble. Um, but, but but those are the first that come to mind. And uh, But there's a lot of them. Come to the ESPBA. We welcome you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, your candor is very much appreciated. So, um, any last words on what to expect this year in the EUS PBA circuit? Ah, huh. well, we're 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 doing the best we can to uh, to to hold some of the contests coming back in a bigger way this year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, after the pandemic, some that may have had a rough start. We've had a lot of turnover. Uh, in piping and drumming directors, you know, a lot of folks right. just said, well, if I can see this through until after the pandemic's over, after years, I'm just going to try to pass it off to someone else. So I think we're going to have a bit of that this year. I'm, in fact, I know we've got a, a, a number of those. Uh, so we can ask for patience on that as folks learn, but uh, try mm -hmm. to provide encouragement and, and, and good friendly support to the folks who are doing that. Um, I think we've got a good year ahead coming off a, a, a great year last year with uh, in our own Nick Hudson being the, the, the Inverness medalist uh, last year. There's good things happening in the US PBA, and we're doing our best to make it the best place that we can to keep our standards high and keep raising the bar uh, to, to improve, uh, improve this thing that we all love all the way around. We got to obviously support and foster the drumming. That's always yes. been something that's an issue. Um, but all the way around, um, uh, we're, we're doing what we can to hold the banner for high, raise it up a little higher now that we're clear of the pandemic and things like right. that and, uh, and get ourselves reorganized and, and in a better, uh, situation out of crisis management, if you will, and moving forward into the future. Mm -hmm. And, uh, obviously, uh, I, we've, we know now that, uh, city of Dunedin staying home this year. So which bands do you know of are going to Scotland in the EUS PBA? Okay, I know that, uh, that Ulster and Macmillan are both going in the grade two. Um, even though they're not technically, I don't think they're registered members. I think St. Thomas uh, alumni is going over. Of not course. sure about Not sure about the school band. Um, uh, not certain about Worcester. Uh, uh, I hear maybe a tentative rumbling that they may be going over. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the lower grade bands uh, at this point. Uh, there is a, a young youth band from the Carolinas here that's going over. Uh, a youth-based band out of Charlotte, which I'm home of my own playing uh, background. I'm so excited to see them going over. The Queen City United band going over. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there'll be some some of the lower grade bands as well. But uh, looking to see what happens with these with these grade two bands uh, that, that that've been working hard. They've been working hard. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for appearing on the show, Bill. On such short notice, it was terrific. To, and it's terrific to hear from you. 
I mean, uh, I've all I've already am working on getting Jeffrey Mann and Jim Sim to appear as well. There you go. And uh, it's, ni it's nice to have uh, somebody on my on my side of the <laughs> of the continents. <laughs> Yay! Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I do so appreciate the invitation, and uh, um, I, I, I'm very humbled and honored to represent the USPBA. A few years ago, if somebody asked, told me I was going to be in this position, I'd have never thought it. But uh, um, I, I'm very humbled and honored uh, to be represented for uh, for our association and to be associated with great people such as yourself. Yeah. And thanks so much for all you're doing to promote Pike and the Drumming here in this uh, on this online venue. Thank you so much, Bill. Um... We will. I will definitely uh, keep in touch. See what. Uh, keep an eye on what's going on in in your side of the world. And uh, yes, I'll definitely stay in touch with you for sure. Be happy Thanks to so follow much, up. Bill. Happy to follow up. Thanks so much, Renee. Thank you. That was Bill Cottle, president of the EUS PBA. When I come back, my final thoughts. Once again, thanks to Bill Cottle for appearing on the show. Now, I'm going to take a break from talking pipe band because this is a time to ponder what we saw over the weekend. As I mentioned, I took part in a special ceremony in my city, in my band city of Guelph, a city that was named from the surname of the House of Hanover in of Guelph. As a Canadian and as one who has roots in this country going back more than 10 generations, even before the name of Canada was even con conceived, I would say that I have more than a good perspective on what it means to be Canadian. My ancestors became British subjects after the Battle on the Plains of Abraham, after Quebec, having been banned, uh, abandoned by the Kingdom of France, had to surrender. Am I bitter about that? No, not at all. It may be an unpopular thought to have as a French Canadian, but the truth is the truth. It was the actions of the royalty of France that would eventually lead to the French Revolution, and if the French in France were getting increasingly unhappy, it would not come as any surprise that the people in Quebec were no happier. So I am at peace with the British conquest of what was once called New France, and my family, uh, my, my Quebecer side of the family, are strong Federalists. We believe in the preservation of our culture as a part of this country, knowing full well that the Francophonia in Canada went well beyond the Quebec borders. 
Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New and New Brunswick, there are strong Francophone enclaves all over these provinces. And to have given Quebec what they think they want is to do the same thing we condemn France for doing to my ancestors three centuries before the Quiet Revolution even began. That is why my Canada has always included Quebec. We preserved our family traditions and our culture without any help from Quebec. So why am I talking about this? Well, on Saturday, a king was crowned, and as always, there are just as many Republican factions in my own country as the very country that consecrated and crowned our king. And yes, he is my king. I am a monarchist. I believe in a constitutional monarchy because of what it has done. Our king serves. He is not served. It is a concept that is alien to a lot of republics because the monarchy in Britain has evolved over centuries to become what it is today. It was the very first declaration King Charles made when he was welcomed to Westminster Abbey. I came not to be served, but to serve. There was a civil war way back that settled this and ensured that not only Magna Carta was adhered to, but the role of the sovereign became more of a constitutional custodian than a ruler. It is the best of both worlds. Our governments are, are elected, but the king remains vigilant in ensuring that the government functions. It's not perfect, but it works. The king is not just a leader uh, and head of state. He is the moral voice of the people. He is there to remind the powers that be of their obligations to the nation. It is a model that was put into place in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and several other countries. Not all of them like it, but having looked at the alternative and the chaos in the monarchies that have become a republic, I'm glad that we still have a monarchy and having a head of state that is constitutionally bound to serve and act as a custodian rather than a ruler is actually the best way to go. Now, we all know the controversy with Diana and Camilla, and, but it wasn't the king's fault that what happened to the last princess of Wales did happen. It was the people who are looking for a quick buck by making, by getting pictures of the late princess. When one is the prey, being chased by a predator creates panic, and panic creates poor decisions, often leading to tragedy. And let's face it, the paparazzi were predators, whether they admit it or not, but it wasn't just their fault. It was our fault as well. We made it possible by buying those magazines and publications that paid for those pictures, and each picture became more and more valuable as she kept running away. But we know how that all ended, and it tore the royal family apart. But time heals all wounds, and the royal family healed and changed with the times again. Whatever grievances existed, they went away with the queen. That era has ended, and the Carolian era has begun. Now I have seen many countries turn away from the crown and what it stood for to them, and I can empathize with those people who seem to believe that the only way to achieve reconcil reconciliation with the monarchy is to abolish it. But those countries have found that those problems don't end when they turn away the monarchy, it only begins. Perhaps those countries that seek to do the same should do what Canada's First Nations did when they saw the king over the weekend. They expressed their concerns to the king and made sure someone was listening. And a man like Charles is one who listens and has a strong desire to do good with the tools that he has been given. His reign won't be anything like his mother's and we may see, he may see another 20 years if he is lucky. But when it all comes down to it, he knows what his job is. His job is to bring the monarchy into a better place as the Third Carolian Era gives way to the Fourth Wilhelmian Era as his son will surely reign longer than his father. As it would be said in my country, long live his majesty, Charles III, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, Canada, and his other realms and territories, King, head of the Commonwealth, and defender of the faith. May your majesty's reign be long and prosperous. And sir, if you ever want to talk to me, it'd be the greatest honor a YouTuber ever had. And wouldn't that be something? 
Now, even if you're not royalty, <laughs> you'll always have the honor of choosing whether or not you like this show. And if you're truly noble, you may even want to subscribe and ring that bell. Let's get this into the hundreds and into the thousands so we don't have to joust for your attention and presence. I hope to have an update for you during the week. In the meantime, keep your eye on this channel and consider liking the Pipe Band TV Facebook page while you're at it. So you can stay up to date on the latest here on this channel. I'm Renee Goche. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.